Hi friends, my name is Lauren Case and I'm the creative director of Interactive uh, at Meow Wolf. And it's really, really special to be in this part of the world and here in Texas today. I am, I'm actually originally from Texas. This is me in the blue bonnet, this is a little girl. And I have a lot of family history here. These are my great grandparents and they were ranchers in Big Bend National Park before it was a park. So being here in El Paso and having the chance to talk to you is very special. Um, you, you got a bit of my intro already, but we'll, we'll go through it again. I got my start at the MIT Game Lab uh, as an intern, and then I went on to make games and work on games like Monument Valley 2, Luna, Where the Water Tastes Like Wine, did a brief stint at Apple as a designer, and now I have very happily and very luckily made my way back to the American Southwest to be the creative director of Interactive at Meow Wolf. And Meow Wolf is a B Corps art collective based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we make large scale interactive immersive installations. But I am not here to talk about Meow Wolf today. I'm here to talk about video games, which are still an incredibly important thing to me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I knew as soon as I was invited to speak here that I wanted to talk about games. And that made me incredibly nervous and scared to do an El Paso. I think that the rhetoric around games right now is that they are inherently violent, that they're competitive, that they are only for teenage boys or bad immature men. And I know that games can be, and they are, so much more than that. And I just want to introduce you to some of my favorite games and some games that maybe you haven't seen, some types of things that you maybe haven't seen, and talk about why I think this medium is really important and meaningful and worthwhile. So the first thing that I want to talk about is empathy, that games can be, and they are, inherently empathetic. I went to a talk once by a guy named Evan Skolznik, and he said that a great storyteller will show, not tell, but a great game designer will do, not show. And to play a game you are doing, you are embodying someone else's story which, not always, because I, I don't know exactly what story you would be embodying when you're playing Tetris, but usually. And that's the definition of empathy. It is to be able to project yourself into somebody else's frame of reference and understand where they're coming from. One of my absolute favorite examples of this is a game called Bury Me, My Love by Dear Villager, the uh, studio. And this is a game about Mahid, who's a Syrian refugee, and he's texting with his wife, Noor, as she makes her journey to reunite with him. And it looks like WhatsApp or Messenger or any other messaging app, and it takes place in real time over the course of a week. Uh, so you get push notifications from her. And she asks you for advice as she travels. Should I get on that boat? Should I trust this man? Should I buy a flashlight or a life jacket with the last money that I have? And you have to advise her. And you don't have the information to advise her well. You have to guess, and it's terrifying. You also send each other selfies and love notes, and you interact in all the ways that a modern couple separated by distance is gonna interact with technology. And these people become incredibly human. And you get to project yourself into their frame of reference. Another game that I think does a really good job of making us be more empathetic is a game called Depression Quest by Zoe Quinn. And in Depression Quest, you are playing as somebody with depression. And you have to get up, go to work, talk to your partner, seek help. And it's hard, it's a hard game. And she made it specifically to help people empathize with people who are struggling. Something else games can do is they can be so personal. I think when we think of games, a lot of times we think about the giant blockbusters, 
but this technology is getting more accessible and it's getting cheaper. And that means that individuals or groups of individuals can make games and they can make games about very personal stories. A very beautiful example of that is a game called That Dragon Cancer by Ryan and Amy Green. It's autobiographical and it's about their son Joel who was diagnosed with terminal cancer at 12 months old and lived for four more years after that before succumbing. And it is their way of telling their story of their time with their son, of playing on the swings, of holding him through chemo, and finding meaning and solace and struggle in their own religion in the face of the unknowable and the unthinkable. Or something a little lighter, uh, a game called Leave Oma, which means love grandma. This is by a friend of mine, Florian Veltman, and it is about going for walks in the woods with your grandmother and picking mushrooms and listening to her stories. And this is also autobiographical. Um, and her helping you understand your parents' divorce. Florian said to me once, he wanted to make games that felt like getting a warm hug. And I think Leave Oma does a very good job of that, so if any of you need a hug, I would highly suggest it. Games can also be subversive. Games can teach us things that we might not have engaged with unless we were doing it through play. Um, Another one of my favorite games is called Perfect Woman. It's by a woman named Leah Schoenfelder. And in it, you have to move your body in really odd ways in front of a screen and try and fit into these boxes that are the perfect woman box. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can level up to be all these different kinds of perfect women. So there's the perfect mother, there's the CEO, the foreign minister. You can even give a TED talk. Uh, but it's funny, it's really funny, and it's funny to watch people play, it's like personal twister, but when, you're, when people are playing this game, they also engage with the question of, what does it mean to be a perfect woman? And what are these archetypes? And uh, why, why is this funny? Probably because the idea of a perfect woman is funny. There's another game called Herna by creator Momo Pixel, where you're playing as a black woman who is traveling, and you have to swat people's hands away from your hair. Uh, and it's fun, it's just so much fun. Uh, it's mechanically a very good game. It also gets people engaged with and talking about an incredibly difficult subject around personal space and bodies and race that it can be hard to get people to talk about. But if people are laughing first, they, they might engage with you. And another game that gets people to engage with hard questions is a game called Papers, Please, which is by a guy named Lucas Pope. And you play an immigration officer in a faux Soviet state. And he made it, at the beginning, specifically fun. The mechanic is fun. You are trying to get through these papers as quickly as possible and stamp them before the time runs out. And once you're engaged, he starts asking you some really hard moral questions. Like, if you have a mother who needs to be reunited with her child, but she doesn't have all the right paperwork, do you let her through? What about the diplomat who is known to be illegally employing young girls? And you have to make this decision in a split second, and you don't have all the information, a lot like, uh, bury me, my love. And it's terrifying, and it will make you question yourself. And something else games can do. Uh, and I talked a little bit about mechanics and systems, is that they can illuminate systems. That to be good at a game, you have to learn the system and the mechanic that you're playing with. Uh, but games can illuminate real world systems that are bad, and importantly, how we can change them. A great example of this is a game called Parable of the Polygons by V. Hart and Nikki Case, and in it, you are just moving shapes around on a board to try and make them happy. And the shapes are gonna be happy based on different things. So some shapes might want to only be next to shapes that look like them. Some shapes might want to be on a board where at least half of the shapes are like them. Or some shapes might only be happy if at least one other shape doesn't look like them. 
And I won't spoil it, you should all play it, it's for free online. But through this play, you learn how our seemingly harmless actions and choices can hold up and create very harmful systems. And you learn that through systems, through data, through numbers, and through play. And more importantly, you learn how we can change it. And that is incredibly powerful. And lastly, I wanna talk about um, something really personal and, and what for me was my most meaningful moment as a game designer. The last game that I worked on was a game called Monument Valley 2. And Monument Valley 2 is about non-Euclidean geometry and space, but it's also about mothers and maternal narratives and passing things down through generations of women. And I was really lucky that my mom got to come to the launch party. And um, that's my mom. And uh, she got talking to this little girl at the party, who's she's probably eight years old, about the game. And um, what, what the mother in the story was feeling when she said goodbye to her little girl and what it meant to be a mommy and their own mothers. And it's really small, it was, you know, it's a thing at a party, but um, in that moment, a game connected three generations of women and had them talking about their stories. Uh, and I'm not here to say games can change the world. Uh, I worked in Silicon Valley and I got out and I came back because I'm really tired of that rhetoric from tech companies. But I am here to say that games can be beautiful and they can be impactful and they can be so, so positive. And I've experienced that very personally and I genuinely hope that some of you in this room have the chance to do that as well. These are all the games that I talked about today um, in my information and thank you.